Welcome to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we equipped you to more effectively lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. Each week, we help you sharpen your leadership acumen by cracking open the playbooks of dynamic leaders who are doing big things in their professional endeavors. And now your host, leadership tactics and organizational development expert, Karen Farrell-Rhodes. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and thanks for joining another episode designed to help you better lead at the top of your game. You know, as you know, for season three, each month we're featuring leaders who have interesting roles in a particular industry. And today's episode is part of our special series featuring the perspectives of journalists and editors in the media. And on today's show, we're going to give you a taste of an expert who covers the business news industry. We're so proud to feature Jennifer Lee Parker, former editor-in-chief at Huge Moves Magazine, which is owned by Huge Incorporated. Huge Incorporated is a groundbreaking, editorially independent tech and design magazine. So you definitely want to check that out. It was fascinating to hear how Jennifer transitioned her dreams of conquering Broadway into becoming an extremely accomplished business journalist with the likes of outlets such as Forbes and CNBC. Listen to how she leads her staff at a company that only produces one publication a year on the biggest stories of our times. And I'm sure you can agree with me that that one publication must be guaranteed to be a doozy in order for them to be able to stay in business, right? Uh, But her story is absolutely fascinating. I know you're going to enjoy it. And also remember to stay tuned for just two minutes after the episode to listen to my closing segment called Karen's Take, where I share a tip on how to use insights from today's episode to further sharpen your leadership acumen. And now enjoy the show. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and thanks for joining another episode of the Lead at the Top of the Your Game podcast. Well, today's episode is another episode that is part of our special series featuring the perspectives of journalists and editors in the world of media. And so we're so honored and fortunate to have on today's show, Jennifer Lee Parker, who's the editor-in-chief at Huge Moves Magazine which is owned by Huge Incorporated, and they call themselves a very creative agency. Their magazine is a a groundbreaking editorially independent tech and design magazine, and she's going to tell us all about it in just a second. And Jennifer is New York-based, and her normal beat is focused on um, business journalism, which you all know is one of my faves. Her past work, has been published in in media outlets such as uh, Bloomberg, CNBC, Forbes, Skiff, Surface Magazine, and the Washington Post. So welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Thank you, Karen. I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate it. Oh, we are so happy and honored to have you. Can't wait to delve into some of your stories and perspectives on great leaders um, in the world of business. And But before we do that, We'd love to learn just a little personal tidbits about you. So just as much as you feel comfortable, would you mind giving us a sneak peek into maybe a bit of your personal life and passions? Oh, of course. I'd love to. So yeah, I'm based in New York. I've got a husband and a baby girl. I've got a toddler. Uh, her name is Grace. She's the light of my life. Yeah, I guess I, I'm, a, I'm a working mom, first and foremost. But I actually, I came to New York City with bright lights in my eyes. And I I wanted to study theater. And so I came up and I was, you know, studying playwriting. And I I took, you know, a lot of acting classes and and did that whole thing and and just really kind of pounded the pavement and, and black box theaters and was, you know, unemployed and working in restaurants. But it's funny, when I look back on that time, it was all about learning about storytelling and learning about narratives and how stories work and how theater works. And, um, and I was just so nerdy, you know, I would, in this acting school, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, I was always like the first kid in the library and the last kid to leave. And I just was like consuming play after play after play. And I, I remember just sitting like my first Broadway shows. I mean, I saw Rent and I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life, you know? And I, 
I grew up in Florida. So, so I, you know, I came to the city thinking like, wow, this is where culture is. I mean, I've only seen the beach right. and a movie theater like this, you know, in a mall basically is, so it felt like this explosion of culture and stories and sort of ambition and creativity. So I, I just had to be in New York City. I came in 2000, which makes me sound old. But anyway, I, <laughs> I've, been here for, I've been here sort of pounding the pavement ever since. But it's funny, like, I didn't intend really to get into business journalism. But the two things that sort of shape New York for me are theater and Wall Street. Yes. And, and so now I'm a business storyteller, which is sort of, to me, it's like, oh, that's neat. That's a combination of the two. I don't know how that happened, but I guess I stayed here so long. I just absorbed New York and here I am. So well, what yeah. a great story about a combination of two of your main passions. You might not have known that was going to be part of your career journey, but what an amazing use of both of them, because you're right. It's basically storytelling in business and understand the dramatics of it. I got to ask you, did you have sticker shock when you went to New York from Florida? Oh, oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember just, I remember being so grateful that there were those sort of nut carts on the street that you could get for two bucks because that was protein and I could like get through the day. A banana and the candied nuts cart. I'm, I'm telling you, it got me through my first three years. Oh, <laughs> I, I was like, only American working in an Irish pub for a while, but that's kind of another Another, another story. story, right? We have to do another whole episode on that one. <laughs> That's another one. But I definitely didn't come here with a silver spoon. So I found a way to kind of, uh, journalism became my meal ticket. Gotcha. So that's, that's, you know, and sort of, that's how storytelling kind of saved me in a way. So, yeah. so can you start by sharing it with us a little bit? Uh, let's go deeper about when you jumped into the world of, of journalism. Yeah. Where did you start and how did your career progress? Yeah. So I got really, really lucky with some early internships. I went undergrad to uh, Columbia and uh, you weren't really supposed to go to the grad school courses except for a few. And I remember just trying to get all the journalism gr classes I could. Um, and that led to, I knew I needed to get sort of great internships. And so that led to some really lucky breaks. I was an a intern at MSNBC and then CNBC. The way that I got to CNBC, which is in New Jersey, I and that was my first real job as a cub reporter. So that was when I really got to test my mettle. Can you like, tell our audience what a cub reporter is? Oh, sure. Just the bottom of the rung. You know, like you're fresh out of school. They don't know what to do with you. You don't know what you're doing. And they say, you know, why don't you submit your copy to an editor? Uh, it's going to be heavily edited. We're going to tell you how to do it and what to do. And you need to be able to take feedback and do it on deadline and quickly. So you're really sort of thrown into, you know, the the hot box of a of a television newsroom. So it's a g amazing learning curve. Like you just learn how to write on deadline, and you learn not to be wrong because <laughs> uh, sometimes your copy is going to show up on television. And so it's a bit of a culture of urgency, and it's a pressure cooker. But it's that kind of thing where, well, it takes pressure to make a diamond. You know, like it it just takes a lot of that practice. So it was like, it was kind of like being on a sports team, a journalistic sports team. So I highly recommend to any young kids that just want a great internship, go into TV, go into a newsroom. It's super intense. You're going to be exhausted, but it's, it's such great training just to be a writer. Nice. I think one of the great sort of freedoms that comes from like in my heart, I'm just a writer and I'm no better or worse than any other writer out there. It's just that the reporting gives you this kind of superpower because when you're dealing with facts or something that's really happening in the world, it gives you this kind of, I don't know, like you can, the, the world is so crazy. You kind of can't make it this stuff up. Like it's, it, the truth is sort of more exciting than fiction. Right. But I, is what I found sort of in that kind of training period in my life. But that led to, uh, so that, so CNBC sort of led to Bloomberg um, and Bloomberg, I, I, got, I got interested in culture and travel writing. And then I was hired as an editor at, at a design magazine, Surface Magazine, where I learned so much about the design world. So to sort of bring you up to speed of how, you know, how do you become an editor in chief all of a sudden of a, of a design and tech magazine, really, I, I learned how to do that. Um, thanks to uh, the editor at the time, Spencer Bailey, really, show, I worked for him, he showed me the ropes of what it really means to tap into the design world and get into like the real zeitgeist of 
What are architects doing? What are digital designers doing? What are artists bringing to the world? And so it's almost its own language, but it was a wonderful way to sort of learn Surface Magazine. I still have huge respect for, um, uh, but yeah, that sort of taught me how to to edit and, and to write in a way that was more sophisticated than I ever had to had to even, you know, conceive of. So interesting. And when you say artists, are you talking about digital artists that have uh, digital versions of their art, like NFTs? Or are you talking about a different world or a different topic? Yeah, no, I think it's funny. It's top of mind because our, our new cover artist is uh, Rafik Anadol, who is a, a multimedia artist. So someone who can basically use more traditional platforms and then someone who could, you know, take a bunch of different painting, you know, sort of photos, feed it, you know, create their own algorithm and actually generate something that's never existed before. That's sort of what I mean. Amazing. I, a modern digital artist right now, because he's at the cutting edge of that. Um, um, so I've interviewed a few, a few sort of AI artists, I would say. Mm -hmm. They're just top of mind right now because they're sort of blazing a trail into new realms. Wow. That is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And so is that the area that that huge covers or can you tell us more about your publication? Yeah, yeah, of course. So it's called Huge Moves. The company is a creative consultancy. And so it's just a great place to be as a creative because there's so much intelligence that comes from from working there. I mean, they're they're listening to their clients all the time about what challenges their clients face, you know, what what problems they're really grappling with. And it also has a, a large department that's data and insights. And so there's this department that's giving us, you know, insights into what's coming ahead in the marketplace. And on top of that, we've just got these, like a whole team of executives that help me stay on the cutting edge. So I guess where it dovetails with a cutting edge artist, like someone like Rafiq Anadol is, they, it's very forward looking and almost futuristic because their clients need to be really at the cutting edge of their businesses and their industries to be able to remain competitive. But basically, the publication has to kind of capture that spirit of we're at the cutting edge of design and technology. We're not looking backwards. We're not doing any historical kind of treatment stories. We're really, there's a sort of energy of we need to be almost prescient so that our readers who are top business leaders can look ahead of the curve. Gotcha. So yeah. You're kind of a curator of what is cutting edge and edgy around the world in this space. So, and they love to probably follow you all to stay on top of that. Correct? Yeah, that's really the idea. Curation. Yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that. <laughs> um, so, like, so we're only. I mean, we're two years old. So, our second issue is about to come out in October. Our oh, first congratulations. Issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited about it. Our first issue came out last year. And we sort of declared what we thought, we go through a long process of figuring out, you know, what are our 10 huge moves for, for the year ahead? So first issue was 10 huge moves for 2023. Next issue is 10 huge moves for 2024. We do an annual publication. And that's like kind of a strong choice. You know, we're in the media scale, it's not really that separate from media, right? Somebody can go read New York Times or Fast Company. There's a, a wealth of media out there that's yeah. this going to feel inspiring and informative. Our, I think where we are unique is I really just have a fundamental belief in long form storytelling and the power of that. And so I'm, we're not in the game of high volume at the expense of quality. So it's an annual publication. We have it once a year. It's 10 features and 14 stories total. Most magazines that you read on a monthly basis have one or two features. Right. We're, we're like, we have 10. And so it's, there's kind of this gravitas to it. And there's a lot of, and it takes us all year to produce this thing. Wow. And it's a really a labor of love, but it just comes from this place of, you know, a lot of people ask us, why are we even doing a print magazine? Honestly, it's because I believe, I think it's really a privilege to interview business leaders and artists and, you know, just great thinkers at the top of their game. Just, mm -hmm. just as you, I'm sure, are inspired by the people you interview all the time. All the time. I mean, to me, what's exciting about it is when you set something down in print, it gives it permanence. And honestly, like our publication, we, we're obsessed with design and technology trends, and we really want to stay at the cutting edge of that. 
but there's something there's something else that makes it sophisticated which is it's not really about egos it's about big ideas and so the 10 huge we want the ideas to last all year it's not really about who it is or what they do or what their title is these are the 10 huge moves that we cover are ideas that are so big that you kind of can't ignore them. So I'll give you an example. One of our writers is covering like the, the Apple, you know, partnered up with Goldman to offer an, uh, a new fintech product, which is Apple savings. Over $10 billion you know, dollars has been invested in this almost as soon as this product hit the market. It's the kind of move in fintech that is so big in the retail banking industry. You just like you just can't ignore it. It's like right. a wave walked in and, and you're just like, okay. So that kind of describes what a huge move is. But the other thing I want to say about, I want to give you another example. So healthcare, for example, it's something that's like a super sensitive topic in America. And I, you yeah. know, something that really I've struggled with as just, you know, a, a working mom, right? Sure. But what I would say is Amazon bought one medical for $4 billion and our story is called the $4 billion bet. I saw that. Yes. And it's like, that's a tech company that's coming into the pharmaceutical industry and disrupting things. It's just another example of you can't not cover that. You know what I mean? It's so big. It has this ripple effect. And we're fast. I'm fascinated as a business reporter. Who's behind it? What's who are the people, you know, who are the characters in that story that can help bring it to life? And so one of my like really, um, people, when we're talking about inspiration, one of the people I just, I love his work so much and I've always followed it as a business reporter is Michael Lewis. So to me, people think of him, oh, he's an author of books, but I see a business reporter. He, you know, he wrote the money ball. He wrote the big short. He's written flash boys. You know, he's written, he's written about wall street and about business in a way that follows the character. So we feel like when we watch his movies and when we read his book, Captivate you you're just in it, you know? And so that's, that's kind of my guiding light is I, I want to bring this sort of personal, the personal human life stories to, to the business world in a, in a way that like, it's, these aren't hot takes. It's not really research, you know, research. It's not just research-based analysis, although we, we use a lot of um, data from our data and insights team. But it's probably different lenses, right? Of the story that you're telling and pulling it all together for your readers. Yeah. It sounds like a piece of art within itself. That's what I thought of when you were describing it. And maybe I'm just, you know, <laughs> I'm an emotional person. So I, I love to see the beauty and things like that. Well, but, I mean, this was our know. first year. I'll share it with you. So this oh. was an AI. It, br- it brings sort of AI to the fore. So this was, ge- this was a generated image and it has the 10 huge moves listed on the back. In the back? I feel like, right. such a nerd. like here's my magazine, but you know. <laughs> Well, listen, for those of you that are just listening on the podcast, check out the link to the YouTube. So go to make sure you go to the show notes afterwards. You can see what Jennifer is showing as the cover. Um, I bet, you, you know, you'll be really impressed. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. It's a labor of love. But, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's important to say also when you make a publication that's this long and it really, you know, you're, I hire a lot of journalists that are really leading business journalists as well. And so I I feel like I need to protect their careers as well. And so it's something that I hope gets better with every iteration, right? Oh, When we put out the first issue, I always think, well, I want to improve with the next issue and on and on. It's about trying to make it better every time. Wow. Well, congratulations on your success thus far. We're so excited. I don't know. Is it a pri- um You have to be on a subscribe list to get them. How do people or can the general public um, get a pu- purchase a publication? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're not cut. We, it's it's kind of a luxury product. It's a limited edition, and so we're doing direct mailing to our network. So really, it's just we we've got our uh, email address on the on the website, and we can, and we really direct mail it to people that that are interested. Mm-hmm. Free for a reason. We want everyone to engage. Everyone who's interested to engage with it. Um, it that is that is kind of a big choice too. I mean, we're not selling ads into it, and we're not we're not in the subscription game. It's really kind of a luxury kind of coffee table product to to bring our best ideas to the fore every year. So yeah, so it's honestly, email us and we'll send you a coffee. Okay, well, we'll have information about that in the show notes, everyone. 
you've heard two examples of the ideas that they're writing about, which are applicable right this second and are could be uh, world changing. So definitely, if you're interested, don't waste their art. If you're interested, add your name to their email list. It is limited edition, though, I should say. We're only printing 1,500, so that's, there is a limit to it. But, okay. But, but I would love to have, I would love to have more, <laughs> more readers, the better, for sure. Well, I bet. Wonderful. Well, Jennifer, because you have covered, you know, I'm sure even throughout your career, so many great stories and great people leaders, great company leaders, great nonprofit leaders, you know, just in the world of business. I'd love to ask you if there is a leader, and it can be any entity, famous or not, that has really impressed you that you consider leading at the top of their game. Sure. Well, the top journalists, I would say, are for me, are Kara Swisher, but also Stephanie Rule. And I, I listen oh, to yes. a I lot. Do. Of I love Pivot. But Stephanie Rule is someone who I met personally when I worked at um, Bloomberg Television. And then she probably, there's no way she remembers my name because I was a bit of a a shy wallflower just, you know, typing away at my computer all the time, hunched over my desk. But um, she does something which I think is kind of miraculous. She speaks her mind. She's not afraid to be provocative, but she's also not afraid to like share her family life and be a whole person. You know, when I was first coming up, I was so afraid to be myself in the office. I was intimidated, but I mean, I was surrounded by uh, people at CNBC and Bloomberg television are, are really titans in media. So I was nervous. Mm. And she's somebody that really just captures this confidence in herself on she camera, can. on and off camera. And she just seems so fearless to me. And I guess that's, she's somebody who I think, you know, she doesn't always do a easy interview. She asks tough, tough questions. She, she doesn't get steamrolled. And she sort of lives out loud. She's also, by the way, I think there's a conf, there's something that's common to Kara Swisher and Stephanie Rule. Because they're they good both, friends, if I'm not mistaken. Friends, yeah. they, but, but they both work all the time. Uh-huh. I think that's the dirty little secret about it. Like, they work all the time. And honestly, I do. I mean, I work nights and weekends sometimes. And yeah. that is the truth of it. And I just don't want to sugarcoat that for anybody because this is a competitive space. And it is, it takes a lot and I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it so much. But so <laughs> Stephanie Rule is kind of, is kind of like a guiding light. Well, I'll high five you on that one. She's one of my faves as well. But, and I, so you have the inside scoop that you know that she, she works here, but it doesn't surprise me that either she or Kara work so much because they are very passionate about what they do. And it seems like they made the choice to do that. I might be wrong. I'm not a personal friend of either one of them. I just follow them. But it seems like they have made the personal choice to deeply intertwine their personal lives and work lives and try to prioritize what needs to be prioritized at the moment. That's the story I tell in my head anyway. (laughs) I don't know if you've gotten that impression. Right. I mean, They don't hide the fact that it's messy and it's kind of, I mean, it's a hard hard industry, really. Yeah. It it shocks me that both of them are able to do what they do and they still have to, you know, do the dishes. I mean, (laughs) but I love that. I love that about them. I love it when Kara talks about having to clean her kitchen and that she cleans her own kitchen and that her partner, you know, Scott goes on Scott free August, but that she works throughout. I mean, she's working now, I'm sure. You oh, know, I'm sure she is. I guess while while the guy goes off and like you know travels the world, which I think that's wonderful too if you can do it, <laughs> it you know. But, but yeah, it's something special about both of them because it it feels like they make the juggling look kind of easy. Yeah, definitely. Well, let me pivot for just a second. One of the things we always love to ask our guests about is their impressions on the tactics that I talk about in my book. And I think you're aware I wrote a, a book, commissioned a research study on leadership execution and came out with some of the top tactics that some of the most successful high-performing leaders actually did. And um, you were kind enough to share with me that the one of the ones that jumped out for you was leading with courageous agility. And so for my newer listeners, uh, leading with courageous agility is all about having the courage and the fortitude. Oops, let's see. For the, um, hopefully you hear me. We had a little bit of a technical glitch, but for those who have not uh, read the book yet, um, leading with courageous agility is all about having the courage and the fortitude 
to do what you think is right and stand up for what you believe in, even if the future is uncertain or unclear. And so we were just curious, Jennifer, why uh, leading with courageous agility really resonated with you. Yeah, no, thank you. I find it inspiring because I feel like it's something I have to, that I'm kind of called to do all the time for, to be able to seat of an editor means you do have some responsibility to other people. You know, I'm caring for other writers who, you know, their lives aren't easy and I want to sort of protect their artistry. I think in America, we live in a place, I mean, you see it right now with the writer strike. Yeah. America, this kind of turbo capitalism can really feel like a hostile to the creative arts. And I guess I see myself as someone who's trying to protect writers that are putting themselves out there despite that kind of challenge. I would say creative, courageous agility. Here's, here's what I think of or what kind of resonates with me is the ability to put yourself last. And when I, when I say that, I mean, I'm, that's part of the wonderful thing that's, that comes with working in a larger company that can support a creative enterprise like a magazine. I step back and I, I listen to other people's perspectives and the, those perspectives are diverse. The courage comes in because I get shaken sometimes. I get rocked, right? Because I have strong opinions about what journalism is. I have a journalism background. I have strong opinions about what's a good story, what isn't. And we have creative differences. I work at a company where there's a lot of designers and there's, a, there's people in Colombia, there's people in Canada, there's people in the UK. We don't always agree with each other However, I think that's a major asset because I'm challenged by my colleagues all the time. And it takes courage from me, I think, to go ahead and not just immediately say, no, you're wrong, but to absorb the sort of collective wisdom that comes from the process of hashing things out and then really coming together and cooperating and, and finding alignment on how we move forward together. Yeah. So it sounds kind of corny, like it's a team mentality. But it's really Not true. It is. I honestly, what, and this, this is kind of the, the theme of this next issue is alignment. I honestly don't believe that anyone can make a huge move unless you're cooperating, unless you find ways to align together. I can't do any of this without the support of my company and this and top down support, as well as sort of equal support of my colleagues. And I need them to be sort of, it's kind of like a Ray Dalio concept that you need to be um, radically honest with each other. Yes. Radical candor. Yeah. Yeah. Like this. And, and I was really inspired by that too. I mean, I never worked for Bridgewater and I'm sure I wouldn't make it there, <laughs> but there's really something to that. And I'm finding on a daily basis that hugers do not mince words. They share their opinion. They have, you know, they, and they're, they're super smart people. So it's wonderful to be able to kind of hash that out. But to me, it takes courageous agility to do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do well. I don't always do it well, frankly, but we all don't always do it well, but it, it's the intent when you're trying. And I always, when we t teach our workshops and we talk to people about it, we always say courageous agility does not mean combative. It means exactly what you said, you know, having the courage to share your perspective, even whether or not, you know, that someone's going to agree with it or not, but start the conversation, see where there's agreement or not, see if you can convince them, they can convince you and see where there's a win-win middle ground and said, so, but you got to speak up, right. To be able to do that. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, on a daily basis, what I find is Slack and email doesn't cut it. I mean, you yeah. can definitely have disagreement, you know, get on the phone, get on a video call. I just find that I, I get much further with leadership and just with camaraderie, just having these kind of meetings, you know, and it's hard and it's hard. And when we're all working remotely, it is. Sure. So I have two quick final questions for you, if we can squeeze them in. Um, the first, I'd love to get your perspective, Jennifer, on, on how you think AI is going to eventually impact the whole media space. Super interesting question. Very timely. At Huge, the, they actually consult on this topic or very large companies that are trying to navigate their way through this sort of era. We see it as additive, not dilutive. So I do really look at it as a robot's not not going to take my job, but somebody who knows how to use AI will. So I very much am, feel strongly about it because I've, I've started to play with it. I use it to record interviews and to do transcripts. And, you know, it, it's really kind of basic right now. I mean, it's not writing any of my stories for me, for sure. But if there are ways to 
sharpen uh, an idea or an outline or a format or test an idea, I think we need to be using it. So I, I kind of am of the stance, the point of view that we are embracing AI and it's all about, especially in media, there's another sort of wrinkle uh, that I want to share, which is if you're just talking to writers, you need, I need to say, do something with your life that AI can't do. And I very much feel that journalism is part of that because I'm speaking to people live about their actual real life experience. There's so much human intelligence that a source can give to me in real time. The internet doesn't know it yet. Right. The exactly. AI can scrape the internet all day, but what if I have new information that someone has told me verbally or it slacked or, you know, sent a, a smoke signal. Right. <laughs> but the point is like, it is very, very valuable to bring new ideas to the fore or new information to the fore that the internet doesn't know yet. And that is basically, I feel like I've sort of been put on notice that I need to start chasing that in my storytelling. Absolutely. Internet already knows this. Well, well, what am I bringing to the table? So it's mm -hmm. challenging for sure. sure, but it's also kind of exciting. And I know that I have a lot of faith in my team that we can kind of stay at the cutting edge of it if we work really hard. I, th I definitely think you can. And especially for the, the niche topics that you all talk about in your publication, uh, I think you're, un me personally, I think you're uniquely positioned to be able to do that. So, so that's good. So thank you so much for your perspective. And my final question for you, Ms. Jennifer, is uh, what does it take for you to lead at the top of your game? How do you keep it together day in and day out and look as fabulous as you do? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that's such a cool question. I, <laughs> I think it's coffee in the morning and a glass of red wine at night. No, I'm kidding. It's, <laughs> it sounds good to me. <laughs> it's a lot of coffee. No, it's, it, it's just a passion for storytelling, I guess. I just love, I love reporting. I love being out in the field. I love talking to people. If when I think back it's um, to 2000, when I first came in to New York, I've been doing some version of that uh, all these years. And I think it's just kind of working the, the, the love I have for writing and editing. As long as I stay true to that, I think this, I have this challenge. I, this is my guiding light as an editor. Can you stay true to yourself as a storyteller and also be commercially viable? I think that's a question that that's what gets me out of bed in the morning and keeps me going because it's, it's not a given. You know, you don't know the end of that story when you wake up. So I think that's the challenge. I need to stay true to myself as a storyteller. And I know what that means internally. Um, but the challenge is just try and share it with the world and professionally and have that actually make a difference in the marketplace. Wow. Well, if we could clone you, we definitely sure should, Jennifer, because we need more of that energy in, in, our, in the, the world in which we live. But thank, thank you. you so much from the bottom of my heart and the behalf of our listeners for being part of this special feature series and, and joining us on the podcast. Karen, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Oh, wonderful. And thank you too, listeners, for tuning in to another episode. We are so honored that you came to uh, spend some time with us because we know there's a million other uh, podcasts out there. And as you know, there's only one thing we always ask is that you share our podcasts and our episodes with just one friend so that we can spread the word and help others just like you to lead at the top of their game. Thank you so much and see you next week. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Jennifer Lee Parker, former editor-in-chief at Huge Moves Magazine. Links to her bio, her entry into our leadership playbook, and additional resources can be found in the show notes, both on your favorite podcast platform of choice and on the web at leadyourgamepodcast.com. And now for Karen's take on today's topic of business journalism. From the companies that we work for to the ones we purchase from, business impacts our daily lives. And business journalism is critical in keeping corporations accountable, exposing them when they aren't, and providing consumers with the information they need to make great economic decisions. There are so many business journalism outlets out there, but I thought it may be helpful to share a few of my favorites that do a pretty good job of writing, curating, or teaching business journalism and business news stories that you definitely need to know about. So the first resource is the Rental Center for Business Journalism, who has the goal of improving the quality of media coverage of the business and, of business and, and the economy. 
and I love their curation of the top business news stories from around the globe. Definitely check them out and we'll have links in our show notes. Next, if you are dreaming about becoming a business journal journalist, um, Wharton has some great seminars to fast track your knowledge on topics like the financial markets, accounting principles, corporate strategy, and the global economy. So if you're not wanting a full degree yet, but want to get a deeper dive into what business journalism is all about, definitely um, check this resource out. And then lastly, check out the Society for Advancing Business Editing and Writing. It's called S-A-B-E-W, that's their acronym, um, which is the Professional Association for Business Journalists. It has a ton of information and profiles some of the top business journalists in the industry. Definitely a valuable read. Well, that's all for today. But please remember to subscribe to the podcast and share the podcast with just one friend, because by doing so, you will empower them to also lead at the top of their game. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast where we help you lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. You can check out the show notes, additional episodes, bonus resources, and also submit guest recommendations on our website at leadyourgamepodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by searching for the name Karen Rhodes with Karen being spelled K-A-R-A-N. And if you like the show, the greatest gift you can give would be to subscribe and leave a rating on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast has been a production of Shockingly Different Leadership, a global consultancy which helps organizations execute their people, talent development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives on an on-demand project or contract basis. Huge thanks to our production and editing team for a job well done. Goodbye for now.